From 1963 onwards, we concentrated on satellites in the Cosmos program, which disappeared from Earth after eight days, even though they were still high enough to stay there for a bit longer. They were obviously being brought back to Earth on purpose. They were ideal for our purposes. They took 90 minutes to go around, so we were bound to catch one pass inside our dinner hours. And also, eight days was long enough for a single project, and it gave us a bit of time in between to get our breath back before they launched the next one. We in the group knew that they were obviously bringing these satellites down early for a particular purpose, but from the vast amounts of data that we were collecting, we knew there must be some information in there somewhere, but we didn't know why or what. Ken Owen of Flight International asked me what experiment I would want to do that took exactly eight days, and I would want to do it time and time again throughout the year, 10, 20 times. So I thought perhaps I'd better find out where these satellites were going. This loop of copper wire represents a satellite orbit. And this globe of my daughter's, which we used at the time for demonstration purposes, is the Earth. Now we clip the orbit on, 65 degrees in the northern hemisphere, and check that it's 65 degrees in the southern hemisphere. And the satellite in its orbit goes round and round while the Earth spins underneath it. The satellite is travelling from south to north, during the daytime and from north to south during the night. Mr Perry had shown that the orbits of these satellites would take them over the United States during daylight hours. What we couldn't work out was to why it was important that the satellites should be over there during the sunlight time. On the pass here going up the east coast of the United States, in 90 minutes the Earth turns approximately 22 and a half degrees so the next pass is somewhat to the west. And the pass after that, up the west coast of the United States. Now because the Earth bends and bulges at the equator, the orbit also slowly rotates around the Earth's axis. So that on a given day, if this pass is for, say, Monday, then on Tuesday it will be a little bit more to the west, Wednesday a little bit more, Thursday and so on, until on the following Monday it's going exactly where it went the previous Monday on the following orbit. So in the space of eight days the satellite has covered the whole of the United States and any other part of the Earth completely so that it's got complete coverage. We had always been aware that satellites were used for recording weather information and mundane things like that but here was a particular group of satellites that were covering every inch of the United States during daylight hours and therefore they must be recording some particular information about the United States. Now another thing about these satellites was the fact that we were picking up signals on the eighth day as they came down on their parachutes over Kazakhstan. In order to get these recovery beacons I noticed that I was going along the avenue later in the summer than I was in the winter. That seems strange. People tend to do things earlier in the summer than they do in the winter. Mr Perry asked us the question what comes later in summer than it does in winter? And after much thought, we came up with sunset. Therefore, these missions are dependent upon the position of the sun in the sky, the angle of the sun. That affects the shadows on the ground. Now, shadows produce contrast in tall buildings. Therefore, reconnaissance. These things were spying. But what the Americans are mainly interested in when something is launched is whether it's a satellite or a missile. And what are you interested in? <laughs> well, everything. I mean, every single little thing about them. <laughs> Can you tell us, do you get any financial assistance in providing apparatus for this research? No. Well, wouldn't it help to have more up-to-date apparatus? I mean, we're all at the grammar school. I understood they had some sort of fund for helping with education and equipment. Couldn't you, Mr Slate, apply for that? We did. Once. <laughs> Mr Perry? Oh, Ron Smith. Oh, hi. In the man's satellites, are the voices transmitted on the same frequency as the bleeps? 
Well, yes, they used to be, but nowadays it's starting to get a bit more complicated. They've introduced this frequency shift keying, which is now not even regular. So what we get here is uh, only part of the Doppler curve. Now, Slater may be working on a shoestring, but he's very good at making sure that all the signals are there. No, the bottleneck's with me. What I need is a whole team of mathematicians ready to process all those figures. I was very interested in your talk. Ah, so you teach physics? No, no. I'm a computer programmer. Are you? Who for? Co-op corset factory. <laughs> corset factory? Yeah. Hey, listen, about this computer. It's an Elliot 803. It's a beautiful thing. It's just sitting there, eating its head off, you could say, because it's underused. You know what I mean? If you wanted to send me a set of those numbers in the morning, it would have them all processed and ready for you by the same evening. Take you months on a calculator. If you're interested, here's my number. Thank you. Don't mention it. This was just what I wanted. Thank you. Thank you very much. The space program was growing, and this enabled us to grow with it. It wasn't so much that the computer saved us time, it's that in that time that we saved, we were able to do more things and look at more satellites. Without a computer, we would have been left behind. Peugeot 309. The reality is even better than the dream. Peugeot. The lion goes from strength to strength. donors. If you're moving house, please tell your transfusion center. In October 1964, there was a story on the front page of the Daily Telegraph, man's Soviet space shot expected soon. So that morning during physics practical, we tuned the radio to 19.995 megahertz, which was the frequency for Russian manned spacecraft. Right, run and get me Mr. Slater, will you?
And that sound to you like Vostok. Sounds like Vostok. I don't think it is Vostok. No, no, it's not, is it? You going to tell Swell? No, I will finish the lesson first. <laughs> all right, all right, quiet and down. Now you've got 15 minutes to finish that experiment. But, sir... Uh, all right, all right, now. How far have you got? We waited until 25 past 10, morning break, went over to the school office and phoned the radio and space research station at Slough. This was the place to where all satellite observations were sent. That's right, it's Perry from the boys' school in Kettering. I'm reporting signals on a new manned spacecraft received here at 10.15 a.m. on 19.995 megacycles. The signal was lost at... What? No, 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 no. I thought you might not be aware. That's why I'm phoning you. No, no, I know what Electron 1 sounds like. And besides, Electron 1 has never transmitted from that frequency. What? Cosmos 46? This man's a complete moron. 46 was brought down a week ago. So I put the phone down, especially as I was paying. I hadn't got out of the office when the phone went. Hello, Kettering Grammar School. Yes, will you hold a moment? Mr Perry, it's for you. Oh. It's the Kettering Evening Telegraph. Thank you. Hello? Oh, Dick, hello, yes. Oh, good, good, they've announced it. Triple man. Oh, God. Yes, yes, I knew all about it. I've just found Sly, but they had some clock on the other end. No, no, I will not ring them back. I'll soon find out that I was right. Here was the professional amateur conflict. If they were unaware of it, it didn't exist. But we knew. We'd heard it. It was even better the following day when the Daily Telegraph reported that George Bank, the University of Manchester's radio astronomy place, which had done all the early work on spacecraft, they'd failed to get voices. And we'd had actually had voices uh, four and a half hours after our first signals, where Komarov was saying, um, well, Ya Rubin, Kaxlesisha Minya Prayom, I am Ruby, his call sign. How do you hear me? Over. There's no point in putting spacecraft into orbit if you can't get information back from them. And the science of getting this back is called telemetry, measurement at a distance. So all these bleeps that we've been listening to contains information. Some of these, from things like the Soyuz, the manned spacecraft, Sputnik 4, you heard it go brrrr. That tells the people on the ground where to start measuring from. It's a synchronization pulse and tells you the beginning of what we call a frame. Each frame contains so many words. So 